Aha, very good. Um, I'm not going to read what's on every slide. That's the good news. Uh, so it's up to you. But the bad news is you have to read it. The other good news, it means you don't have to look at me all the time, which is great. I think this whole topic was, uh, the expert group was probably appointed in large part because there had been lots of attention being paid, particularly to home care, particularly to CCACs, et cetera, as becoming a, a, a newsworthy item. And I think uh, uh, the minister uh, had in his mind that maybe some folks should bring some uh, thinking to the whole uh, topic and as well. Uh, there was a primary care report being done at the same time, and as we all know, there had been a number of other reports around issues in home and community care, and as well, uh, the uh, government was awaiting the special report of the Auditor General. So all those uh, events, if you will, conspired uh, to um, appoint the group. And the group was, as many of you know, it seems to often be called the Donna Report. It isn't the Donna Report. It is the result of the work of Kathy Fuchs, Samar Sinna, Kevin Smith, uh, Donna Thompson, and Joan McLeanowitz. And uh, if you ever get called to do uh, this, make sure you get some of those people involved and make sure there's not too many. Having done this before, probably one of the benefits of the work was we were a small group with varied experience and uh, a lot of combined years of expertise. So uh, that's the group. Uh, we did not do, we had a very short time frame. Um, we reported in literally less than six months from the day of our first meeting. Uh, what we did do, though, was survey anybody who would respond to our survey, either in mail or in writing or by phone or whatever means they could, by letter. Uh, and um, we did review the literature, but we did not do any what you might call science ourselves. That being said, we did have a terrific combination of providers, families, family caregivers, as well as clients receiving services themselves, and um, scientists, uh, interested public members, uh, agencies, etc. So I felt, uh, I won't say it's representative, I spent too long trying to be an academic to ever say that. But I will say that uh, we did hear from a tremendously broad representation of people, and uh, many of the themes just kept repeating themselves. I think this is what we heard from everybody, but if I had to say anything about what we heard, I would say the voice of the, what is often called the unpaid, what we call the family caregiver, and I'm going to use the term family, it's not capital F. Sometimes family for people receiving care is the neighbor, is the distant friend, is anybody. So I'm talking about those people who the so-called client consider to be uh, their family. So probably that voice was the most compelling voice. And uh, probably most of us have seen the variety of numbers that spring up, but I think it's arguably 70% of the care provided at home is provided by family members, by these unpaid caregivers. If we did not, were not able to rely on people to care for other people at home, we'd be in a terrible situation. And the kinds of, and we heard from a range of what I'll call the formal or the paid providers, the professionals who are providing care, who also are incredibly frustrated with the need they see and the inability to, to meet the needs of a huge range of folks. I was saying before at the meeting, we used the term uh, frail elderly. Um, to be, to grow old is to grow frailer 
not an illness, it's about aging, and we all, no matter where we are, are going to need some help with something at some point. The solution for not becoming frail elderly is a terrible one. It's not to age. We don't want that. I don't want that. I'm not ready yet. <laughs> but we did hear some, I mean, I, I remember the one comment from a family member who said, I'm not a daughter anymore. I'm a secretary, I'm a nurse, I'm a housekeeper, I'm a cleaning woman, I'm a gopher, I'm a chauffeur, but I'm not a daughter. I remember also another care and for a moment family member uh, saying, I go to bed at night just thinking I can't get sick. And if I get sick in the middle of the night, what will I do? I don't even know who to call to get so somebody can come in and look after my uh, partner. So though if I, if I was struck by anything, and I've been around in healthcare a long t time, and all of us who've heard stories have heard very compelling stories from clients, patients, family members, but it was the plea for attention and support uh, that struck me uh, the most. So the other thing is what struck me, I guess, as well, was how much people are saying, I want to do this. Uh, that's what I signed up for when I became a parent, when I was a sibling, when I became a partner, whatever it is. But I don't know how to do it. I mean, someone has to help me. I don't know what to do. I don't know when to do it. And I, don't, I need sometimes a break and I don't even know how to get access to that. So I think that was probably the most compelling for me. I'm gonna move there, I could give you a lot of examples of that. You'll be glad to know I won't, because it uh, won't get us to, so what are we gonna do about this? We know the situation is not what we want. Uh, but I'm gonna to move to our recommendations, just so we can move the, the discussion along. I guess, the part that means the most to me, and everything else is in aid of supporting this, is the notion that we must move to family-centered care. Now, we all know there's an incredible amount of rhetoric around this. What is different in the home is that the family has to be the unit of care. So whether it's developing a care plan, doing an assessment, it's the whole family that has to be part of that. And it's the family that have to be the real partners, if you will, the co-designers of the care plan. And uh, I know uh, lots of us who work in the field say, oh, we're doing that. But if we are doing it, the evidence is not overwhelming. And if we are doing it, families and clients certainly don't feel like that's what's happening. So I think we need really to pay uh, attention to that. Um, and so what, one of the things we did recommend, and it is in the report, which is easily accessible, if you Google Bringing Care Home or go on the ministry website, you'll find it, um, is we did describe a charter, what we call a charter of rights, for lots of reasons you'll all understand. We tried to stay away from uh, patients' rights and those kinds of things. But we did, uh, a, a did define a charter, and it really goes to what does it mean to have a high-performing home and community uh, care system, and what is it that will uh, ensure that people have access, that there's equity, uh, et cetera, you know all those principles. The other thing we talked about was clarity of services. The reality is very few people actually know what services are available, what they're entitled to, and under what circumstances. And in fact, lots of providers don't know. So it's not just that clients and families don't know. So we made some very strong recommendations and have spoken very, um, I think, strongly, remains to be seen. Um, but for the need to really have a defined basket of services and to sit down and talk with families about here's what the state provides, if you will. Here is what we all agree you need. 
and Hilo also some other things that might be able to help you, some of which may be available without cost, some of which may cost, etc. But to do a really comprehensive development of a plan, not, uh, and that really means to go to an aid-based approach, not here's what we provide, what of it do you want or not, but here's what you need, and we're gonna help you best we can to get what it is you need. So yeah, we provide a bath, but you're right, your daughter who works all day is happy to come in the evening to give you a bath. You need someone in the day to get you out of this apartment house, rooming house, whatever it is, wherever it is you're leaving, take you out and get some fresh air. So it really, that we talked a lot about, about that um, and made several recommendations which you uh, see up there. The other thing we, t we took at word was the minister, the ministry has made many, many public statements that, quote, the Lins are here to stay. So as we told the minister, we took you at your word. So if the Lins are here to stay, then they need to start to do this work. They need to develop a lot of them do. I know some of you are here. This isn't a comment of who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. This is about creating a system and having a set of standards and having a set of expectations, giving the money, setting the outcomes, and holding people accountable at every level for delivering on the desired, desired outcomes. There's not enough clarity system-wide about that. Uh, I, won't, I don't need to talk to anybody in this room, I'm sure, about coordination and integration. And we need those at every level. So we need, don't just need coordination within home and community. We also need coordination and inter, integration beyond health and beyond the home and community sector. So uh, transportation is a critical piece of home and care. Transportation is not part of health. Uh, if you need even wheel trans, that's transportation. That's municipal, that's wheel trans, that's TTC. Health says, go find, there's the website, go find out how you get transportation. That all needs to be integrated. People who are at home with multiple issues deal with transportation, Ministry of Housing, community and social services, education, etc. Practically every other ministry that deals in any kind of human service. So there needs to be better in, uh, integration of that. And one of our um, uh, recommendations actually charges the, minister, the deputy minister of health with beginning to talk to other ministries so that the basket of services for people receiving and needing care at home is truly the basket of services that people at home need and isn't just nursing or physio or pharmacy or whatever. So we were uh, fairly, fairly strong about that. The other thing that was not our mandate, but that we could not ignore, was the role of primary care. And so although in our report we did not spend a lot of time on primary care, we did say quite directly, I think, that primary care must be aligned with the rest of the system. And the notion that the WINS are doing capacity planning and planning home care, et cetera, and that primary care is someplace over there is just really not sustainable. It's not, not acceptable. It's not acceptable that somebody who receives home care and has to go to emerge gets discharged from a merge, maybe with the carbon copy that they can't read of the discharge summary, and told, take this to your primary care provider if you have one, with next time you go. It's not acceptable that a primary care provider doesn't realize that his or her family is receiving home care. This is not an integrated system. I don't I'm sure I don't need to tell you that. In terms of service delivery, right now a home care client is a home care client is a home care client. And so the funding, 
the way so this is organized, the Quechua is all organized around that kind of um, model. We suggest that there were three sorts of populations, if you will, receiving home care. And there's, of course, going to be, if you will, overlap uh, with some of these. But uh, I hope you'll humor me for want of trying to get some clarity. We say there's a post-acute population. Somebody has a hip replacement. They may also fit in another group, but they have a hip replacement. They go home, they need some follow-up, and their whatever mobility difficulties they had because of the need for the hip replacement is fixed, and they go back to whatever they were before they had the hip replacement. Um, that's great. Now you know, I'm sure, that uh, the uh, ministry has already um, um, funded or is about to fund some uh, pilots uh, or demonstration projects, or I'm not sure every day is a different term, but you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> um, to look at integrated models for that population. So it, uh, I guess the prototype was St. Joe's Hamilton, and it was helpful for us that Kevin Smith was on there. We said, since you've already begun to do this, carry on and do this. This works for this population. I'm going to go to the third population. The third population uh, are those people who are at home with profound needs. They have health needs, they have social needs, they have learning needs. And often, these are families where the individual has been a home care client since birth, if you will. So they often have a, a huge range of very complex issues. Complex health care-wise and complex across health and all kinds of human services. These families are already doing the bulk of the coordination for these folks. As a matter of fact, these are the people who are developing all kinds of uh, electronic means to communicate, to receive information. They're the ones who take the photos of problems, send the photos off to their provider, their primary care provider to get treatment, etc. cetera. Um, and for those people, we are suggesting for those families, for those who are able and willing that we use some form of self-directed funding. So, now, we don't get too excited about this. Not everybody wants to do it. Not everybody can do it. And we are not suggesting give them the money and let them go. This remains our responsibility to provide this. We're just saying work with them and let them make choices about what they need in terms of the use of whatever the dollars are. There are a variety of models of this around the world. And in fact, in Ontario, we already have a self-directed fund like that for attendant care. Since a lot of folks who use attendant care are uh, often young people, they were very frustrated with the lack of being able to find the person that's a good fit for them. And so there is a, a, a program already that exists. It has demand uh, that far exceeds the supply. We said put some more money into that. But as well, begin to think of self-directed funding for this other population. The middle group is by far the largest group. And uh, we would call those uh, uh, folks with functional limitations, chronic health issues. You could call these the frail elderly. But they are the bulk of people who receive care at home. And they are the people who, once they start to receive care at home, the needs are not going away. They're not lessening. If anything, they will increase the need uh, for care over time. Uh, and so we're saying, for those people, let's define a lead agency. It can be a group of agency. It can be um, population-based. It can be demographically-based. It can be um, health issue based, but let the LINs define the agency who's willing to take over all the care at, within the targeted budget, 
defining the outcomes, etc., and let them deliver the envelope of care for this population. I, I talked already about working collaboratively with uh, other ministries. Uh, I'd like to believe that it's not a pipe dream that we could have a single and coordinated need-based envelope of funding. It is, having lived in Ontario now for, I don't know, 45 years or something, it's probably not the Ontario way to do it this simply, but I, I like to think we could still do this. And I mentioned already increasing uh, uh, funding for self-directed cares. So there are huge issues of accountability in home care and in community care, and there are huge issues around accountability. It's a very complex system. I would not like you to think that. I think it's just simple and just do a few things. And this is a hugely complex uh, system. And uh, home care has become, A, increasingly more complex. The families who require home care don't look anything like they looked 25 uh, years ago, or even 10 years ago. So this is complex business, but complexity it can't be a reason not to move forward. And it's not going to go away, if anything, it's going to be a bigger piece of, uh, of uh, what we call um, health care. So we're talking about the, the data in home care, uh, let me put it, not as robust. We've spent a lot of time in hospitals, as we should have, getting better data, setting performance indicators, etc., reporting, scorecards, etc. We now need to devote that much, if not more, energy in defining those kinds of things in the home and community um, sector. And um, I'm back again to accountability. You set the goals and you hold the people accountable. And if agency, a group, a collective of agencies is not game to do it within and can't meet the targets, then I guess we shouldn't be doing it. Our final recommendation was an implementation recommendation, and we suggested that it would behoove the uh, ministry to appoint an implementation uh, co-leadership, uh, the, the kind of internal, external model, um, and uh, that that serves a little bit to move things along, keep the feet to the fire, make sure things represent what the broader community want as well as what the government wants and is able to accomplish. So those were our recommendations. Um, but you know, there are a lot of things that need to happen to make any. But we need more research, obviously. We need primary care providers on side. Frankly, I can't see us moving the home care agenda forward in a systematic way without a systematic primary care or a primary care system, which is a piece of healthcare, not beside the healthcare system. Research, of course, data collection, utilization. The other thing is home care. I, I had the privilege and challenge of working, doing some work in long-term care a few years ago, and I would say there were some striking similarities between the long-term care sector, which I personally include in um, home and community, but nevertheless, there are some striking similarities, and one is that we need to get the human resource issues straightened out, and it's not just remuneration, although that is a significant issue. It's also who should be there, what should they be doing, um, etc. Who are they, um, whatever. There are huge numbers uh, of issues. Um, so these were things we weren't supposed to talk about, but we couldn't talk about home care without, and we talked about improving communication. And uh, I've already made mention of that. I won't uh, mention it again. And then I already talked with you about the deputy taking uh, a lead in sort of managing and implementing at least some elements of integration. We didn't, of course, talk or deal with more things than we did deal with, 
for those of you who've done this kind of work before, you go to bed at night and say, we should have, we should have, we should have. But you know, your time comes to an end and you say, never mind, we should have. At least let's tell them we know we didn't do it. So obviously there are huge issues in mental health and addictions with First Nations peoples, with LGBTQ, with end of life. And there are some palliative care in, uh, initiatives underway, we know. Caregiver support is a huge issue. And we made a lot of recommendations around the kinds of supports like respite and um, education, et cetera. But there are all kinds of other things. There are a variety of models of tax support and, and tax benefits, et cetera, uh, et cetera, employee assistance programs, incentives, et cetera. So we need to start to do a little bit of work there. Now, of course, the, the elephant in the room through all of this, which we acknowledged at every meeting we had, both in, in our, by ourselves and with government and, 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 and um, ministry officials, was structure. So we came up with structure uh, saying the following, um, form should follow function, and could we please concentrate on making some change to ensure we have a more robust, needs-based, uh, family-focused system, and that some attention needs to be paid to the fact that we really do not have a policy framework for home and community care. We have a number of programs, and we have a number of initiatives, and we have an amazing amount of terrific stuff that is going on. Terrific care, terrific programs, but if you're on the receiving end, it's the luck of the draw whether you're in the area that has it, or you have the provider who wants to provide it, or you have the kind of family who can muster some resources, whether they're time or, or, or financial. So we need that. But uh, we knew the Auditor General was coming out with her report. Structure was not part of our uh, mandate, and so we did not recommend a structure. So here's what I uh, learned myself from all of this, more than I could put on even 20 slides, <clears throat> but it is incredibly complex, and it's way more complex population than probably we ever thought about when we thought about what we'd be doing at home. Um, and it's just too hard to navigate. The individual has no idea who to call for anything. And home is where care is going to be. We, we know that right now. When you look at what's going on at home, you know that that's only going to be more, <coughs> not less. So we have an obligation. Uh, families are willing, as I said. It's, I'm incredibly impressed with that. Um, we really don't have very good indicators. I'm tired of seeing, as I'm sure others of you are, the very basics of indicators for um, health. So things like uh, bed sores or falls. I'm not saying those things are not important, but quality of life when you're living at home has to count for something. That's why people are staying home. They're not staying at home because they want addressing change. They're staying at home because that's their place. It's where they want to live. And we tell them that's okay. You can stay at home. We want you to be at home. <coughs> Either we have to stop saying that or we have to fix it. Um, and then collaboration is not our strong suit, uh, both uh, within and between and among. Uh, we're trying, and I think we have, again, great evidence. This is about a system, not about can we do this in your uh, limb catchment area or in mine or in some place else. This is about do we have a system that guarantees, if you will, uh, a particular standard of care and attention. And uh, I think there's urgency, but of course, I wouldn't have volunteered. To, all of us were volunteers on the work, on the work, none of us were paid. And I would not have volunteered to do this if I didn't think that now is the time to do something. 
uh, but it does it will require more than a small degree of, of will. So what's happened since then? Well, uh, we really started court in the spring. In uh, June, the minister uh, released his Patients First, the Roadmap to Strengthen Home and Community Care. He has a 10-point plan, uh, and this is it. Uh, and some of that work has begun. Uh, and some of this work is related to our recommendations. So some of it is aligned with our recommendations. Some of it isn't what I would call as perhaps a uh, hurry up and move as uh, we might have recommended, but nevertheless it is aligned. Uh, there is a group working on levels of care. There are two main committees, one an advisory committee, one an implementation committee, and, and they are working on implementation of this. They are doing some work on self-directed care, uh, on a little bit on caregiver support. They've increased the uh, maximum number of nursing hours. Um, and uh, you know that there's been a lot of work and complexity and PSD uh, and PSW salaries and work is going on in there. Uh, the bundle of care, that's the integrated um, models of care uh, where there are about seven, I think, groups that have been funded. So there is some work going on. The other thing that happened is the Auditor General's report came out. The Auditor General's job was, or assignment was to look at the variability in pricing and value. I'll say, in, for want of having three paragraphs, value for money from CCACs. She had some very interesting things to say and uh, said she, she wasn't sure the current structure is delivering on the, um, on the mandate. Uh, as well, everybody has seen the minister's address to the OHA, which talked about being bold and um, doing things and hinted at structure. I got lots of emails about that, but uh, you know, uh, Bottom line for me is the proof is always in the pudding, and uh, so we're waiting to see what those, uh, what that language will translate into in terms of uh, practice, policy, etc. Um, just want to see. So I felt that it would be that. That's sort of the report. I felt it would be inappropriate, especially as I'm a board member, not to, and this is the RDP's annual meeting, not to say something about the role for the RDP. And I purposely didn't put my thoughts down there. I'll share my initial thoughts with you, but I hope you'll also um, be able to contribute because this is a good opportunity for the RDP to hear from you in terms of some of uh, your thinking. Thinking. But if you look at us, uh, I can't claim any um, credit for the new strategic plan since today was only my second board meeting. But I will say if you look at the strategic plan and you, if you think about what I've said about what we need to do, and particularly if you think about where the majority of folks receiving care are, that sort of middle group, it seems to me that RGP is very well placed. And if we talk about RDP's mandate being supporting providers, I'd like to dream in technicolor and say those providers should also include those folks who are providing care at home to the people they care about or have the luck to live beside or whatever the circumstance is. So I think the where is where the folks needing specialized geriatric services. And I would venture to say that over time, if you are at home and live long enough, you will need specialized geriatric services. The bulk of people will. And so I think the where is, wherever the frail elderly are, that's where the services need to be. 
with whom I think this is about partnership. We are talking about collaboration, and I think there are many organizations with whom RGP already does uh, partner and collaborate, and uh, hopefully we'll move to more robust relationships with the other players, decision makers, etc., in the field. For whom I hope we take seriously, for whom is the family who is the unit of care. So that's the for whom for me and when. When was yesterday for me? Because you know the time the times are wasting. I don't know when when I'm gonna need home care and I you know I have a real investment in making sure it's too late for my my mom, but it's not too late uh, for me. So uh, I think it's it's about receiving the day. From other work long time ago that I did in nursing where people in the profession set an objective and, every, and gave a date and everybody said, oh God, that everybody uh, who wants to be a nurse will get a university education. And I remember at the time uh, people <laughs> saying to me, oh, that like what a pipe dream, Gail. And your date is ridiculous. It's completely impossible. And I said, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. But you know, when a lot of colleagues, there's some in the room, we all chatted it up and said, you know, let's just keep talking. We have a good rationale for that. There's more complexity in the system. People need to be edu educated better, blah, blah, blah. They need to work with other providers. And we just kept talking it up. And one day, I remember with a group of colleagues, we said, you know, it's probably not going to happen by the deadline. But my gut tells me it's past the tipping point. Like there's not going to be going back because too many people are talking about it, even the ones that don't like it are talking about it. Well, that's how I feel about this. I think there's been a lot of attention to home care and community care. And it's important to keep talking about it. And when people ask, well, what am I supposed to do? You say, do what you can. And if you uh, consumer, ask, why can't we do this? Push back. And if you're a provider and it's not working well, well, do something. So I still believe uh, change, uh, I'd love to say it happens by a um, really strong group of people who cause a peaceful revolution. But I know it doesn't happen that way. It happens from a lot of people just pushing forward slowly but surely. So I like to think we're past the tipping point.